Hey folks, welcome to the podcast. So we're doing a special series of podcasts which I'm recording over Google Hangouts. So we're doing audio and video because for some unknown reason, people don't wanna come see me face to face right now. But there's always opportunity and the cool thing is I'm able to now podcast with people from all over the world. So we're gonna get an amazing eclectic mix of people from, from different industries, different perspectives to share their story and tell us you know their thoughts and feelings on what's going on right now and all of that cool stuff hope you enjoy it please subscribe in all the usual places and enjoy awesome and we are live thank you everyone for joining and it's great to be joined by alex beckir who is correct from wrong md and gm for europe for rewire sounds about right hi lewis uh nice to see you today Love to talk to you. Great to talk to you too. We were just about to talk about Brexit and then we thought we'd better press record. Um, <laughs> so how, how did, uh, <laughs> we'll talk about that in a sec. Um, how, did, uh, how did an English guy end up in Amsterdam? Oh, that, that is a long story. Um, I guess uh, the, the headlines are, I was, in, I was in Silicon Valley for about a decade and um, probably other juicy topic, US. It's a little bit, you know, less friendly, um, I think, to, to foreigners. Um, I also have like an Iraqi background, so it just didn't really see my home um, anymore recently. Uh, so I actually took a bit of time off, um, you know, wound up in Tel Aviv and uh, was told by a mutual friend I had to meet this company, Rewire, that I'd, I'd share a lot of you know, values with them. How um, did you end up in Tel Aviv? Like I was uh, I just traveling at the time. It took about six months off. I, I traveled around, you know, Australia. I was in New Zealand for a while. And then, you know, I was in Europe for a while too. And Tel Aviv was one place I'd never visited and heard wonderful things about. So um, I was there and uh, introduced to the, the founding team at Rewire. Nice. So Tel Aviv, well, Israel is ha- as a track for one, they try- attract the most money for tech startups outside the US, Israel. Yeah, it's, it's a bit mad, actually. I was really kind of shocked and pleasantly surprised when I got to Tel Aviv. Really does look like, you know, uh, not even a little, but like, you know, a version of Silicon Valley is is growing up there. It's crazy. It's a very, if you have, for those that haven't been, it's, it's, it's very difficult to describe. It's like Mediterranean kind of vibe. It's by the beach. Um, people are super motivated. It's, a, you know, just everything going on in the region just... I think it culminates in this crazy melting pot, doesn't it? Um, yeah, yeah. The, the energy is like off the charts, right? You know, entrepreneurial energy, just like it's a joyful life. It's, um, it's a phenomenal place. Would would warmly recommend people to visit if they, if they haven't already. COVID yeah. allowing, of course. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So you met, so you yeah, met these, so you met these founders, um, probably on the beach somewhere, and they convinced you to uh, to join. <laughs> We did, we did have a, I think a breakfast meeting on the beach, like on the promenade in Tel Aviv. And that was not a bad sales pitch. If you're ever trying to, to sell something, it's a good place to do it. Yeah, definitely. So, so you joined Rewire while you were in Tel Aviv or? We, I kind of, I think I've made the, it's kind of like many stages to joining a company. And I think there's one of the most important is like the emotional decision. You know, I could imagine myself doing this and that emotional decision was certainly made when I was in Tel Aviv, but it, it took about a couple of months to figure out all the paperwork afterwards. Yeah, yeah. It's true, like most of the people I speak to, in fact, I mean, the vast majority of people, you know, if they love their job, it's because they love the people they work with. Or if they're looking to move, it's never, you know, it's never money that's that's the motivator for moving or looking. It's always, you know, it's something about people, the manager, the team, the culture, you know. So it's it's super super important to get that right. Definitely, I think I think money is like necessary but not sufficient. You know, yeah. um, you've got to be able to pay the bills, but it's really, you know, like who are you going to be working with, especially in startups when you know it's going to be mad. Um, like who who are you kind of partnering and teaming up with becomes way more important. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. And I'm just interested to hear about your, because you told me your fair about your background, your family background, obviously Rewire specialise in banking for immigrants. Um, and it seems to tie up quite nicely with your family story and stuff. Yeah, it's, thank, thank you for, for asking. Um, yeah, it, it really was uh, a meaningful mission to me. So like when, when I met the team in Tel Aviv, 
they kind of described, you know, just the difficulties migrants have, like dealing with financial systems, right? You know, at home, in their new country, in their old country. And like, these are like lived experiences for me. Um, my, my dad came to England in the, the 1960s from Iraq and married a girl from Newcastle. Um, so I grew up, you know, in the, in the UK, pretty obliv oblivious to the whole migration thing. Um, until a lot of my dad's family started arriving in the UK from Iraq. Um, this is really after the, the, there was a war in about 1991, the Gulf War, first Gulf War. Um, so a lot of my dad's brothers and sisters, you know, started arriving in England and I, I really saw kind of firsthand how difficult it can be for, for migrants to settle in a, a new country, you know, not, not just in the, with the financial system, um, but also with the financial system. So um, that that certainly struck a chord with me. And then I've had the the luck to have, you know I've been able to move around a bit myself uh, over the years. And um, I, I've lived I've lived it the difficulty of moving countries and kind of getting set up. Um, and I'm quite lucky actually, right? I'm kind of you know lucky enough to be educated, lucky enough to have a job, lucky enough to have the right papers. So for me it should be easy, and it, it, it wasn't. So obviously I, I was kind of connecting my experience and like my family's experience and it, it just it made a lot of sense to me let me put it that way yeah what's what do you what have you found difficult about moving around is it like is it the like the locals in inverted commas aren't accepting immigrants but i mean nowadays i mean a lot of these countries are so are so diverse well i say a lot i mean maybe that's Maybe, maybe that's just living in London is so diverse. I know that a lot of a lot of places aren't, but it feels like you know, in Silicon Valley when you when you when you when you went over there to live and you, and you said you didn't quite quite feel like you fitted in. It, it would feel like somewhere like that would be super open to to welcoming immigrants and stuff. Oh yeah, it's a it's a really good point, right? Um, I mean, let's start with like Silicon Valley. It's like, it is a wonderful place you know like sunshine most of the time beautiful but it, it's surprisingly I would say homogenous for somewhere that is actually incredibly incredibly diverse when you look at the statistics but the, the homogeneity kind of comes in just like a 20 years of uh, tech startups growing really quickly you know attracting a lot of engineering graduates to the region that are you know quite highly highly paid so you know, in, in terms of, um, let's call it national diversity, like there's a ton of different nationalities there. Yeah. But I think a lot of the demographics now are quite, you know, quite similar. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's I, I loved it there, don't get me wrong, but um, it wasn't necessarily like the melting pot of diversity that, you know, you <laughs> might imagine. Um, actually, Amsterdam seems a lot more diverse in my, my right. like, you know, 18 months here. Um, yeah. There seems to be a lot more of like economic diversity and like social diversity here than I saw in Silicon Valley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Silicon Valley is expensive, you know, I mean, to live there, the prices are high. I mean, you know, yeah. better than I haven't lived there. But but it's funny because, you know, America is, is, a, is a country built on immigrants, you know, the whole fabric yeah. of the country, the that whole that whole immigrant mentality and you know, like just starting businesses, entrepreneurial, making money, all of those, all of those things. And it's, it, see, yeah, it seems to have, you know, there's so many social problems there right now that are very public. It seems to have just slightly lost, lost that way. Yeah, it, I think it, it's lost its like shine, right? Put it that way. And I think for anyone visiting you know, a big American city these days, you know, the number one thing that hits you is like homelessness. And um, we could do a whole podcast on homelessness in America and kind of the things that I've seen during my time there. Um, but yeah, even even in like you know Silicon Valley, Google entrepreneurs or Google executives would be sometimes you know looking for economic ways to live. Right? I, I've heard stories about engineers setting up you know mobile homes in the Google car parks and using the offices to shower in just to save on rent. So it's it is. Wow. Um, it's pretty extreme and I, I think you only really feel that when you see it with your own eyes yeah that's crazy it's crazy Europe on the other hand you're right Amsterdam is a great spot the thing about Europe I know it's, I mean the thing about Europe is just so many different nationalities but but Europe also each country is so different culturally you know France different to Germany different to the UK and stuff but when you I think I mean for me London's just the most diverse city I've ever been to. And 
you know, I think it's just, I think the stats are like 50 something percent, maybe 55 percent of people that live in London aren't from the UK, something like that. It's probably changing now with Brexit and COVID and stuff like that. But, you know, it's just amazing. And Amsterdam yeah. too. I mean, it's just, you know, in Europe, you get a real, a real melting pot. Yeah, yeah, it definitely, it definitely feels um, that way. Um, and there's something about living in European cities that um, for me was a, a bit of fresh air having come from kind of the US cities. You know, I think people are just like on the streets a lot more, like walking around. Um, there, there seems to be a lot more kind of interaction, but uh, it might have just been how I was living in the US, but that, I mean, that, can, that vibrancy can, seems, seems a bit different. Well, I'm saying you can just walk everywhere. You know, I mean, if you're in if you're in a big American city, you've got to get in the car and you drive around and, and you know, most people don't live downtown, do they? They live somewhere outside. But, you know, London, mm -hmm. Amsterdam, it's just brilliant to walk around. And also maybe the, loc the location, because my, my family were also immigrants. Um, my dad's family yeah. from Egypt, my mum from South Africa. And huh. yeah, so my uh, both Jewish and my, my dad, all the Jews were kicked out in the uh, in the 50s and then they ended up coming to, to Paris and then London and then my mum wow. came off to university from Cape Town so so they yeah they went through you know I guess they were maybe from Egypt more um not quite refugees but you know maybe somewhere in between and I hate to define it um but then yeah they, then, then they all come to London and it's just in, that, in those days it all went to the east end of London um like many immigrants do mm. when they come to the UK and mm -hmm. yeah, it's just fascinating stories. And I did my DNA test uh, a six six months ago or so. And if, if no one's ah. if not done it before, I'd recommend it because what you realize is how much you share with other people. You just realize like, oh my God, you know, my family from all over here. And and it just, and it just, you just kind of realize that, you know, we have so many more I things in common. <laughs> what, were, what, were, what were your results out of interest? So I'm going to get the percentage slightly wrong, but about, um, so you, you, if you do a saliva test, you do a little stick and then you stick it in the uh, test tube, you send it off. And so it came back and, and they said I was, um, it's about 30% Sephardic Jewish, which for those not into their Jewish history, Sephardic Jews are from like North Africa, essentially. So like Egypt, Syria, Morocco, et cetera. And my, that's where my dad's side are all from. Um, and then um, and then a little bit Middle East, so like Israel style. And then the rest is Eastern Europe, so all my mum's side, um, Lithuania, Russia, etc. So a real mix, you know, a little bit North African, yeah, it's, mostly European. <laughs> it's, no, it's no, English, yeah. no English, you know, so. I love it. So I, I've also done one of these. I'm, I'm amazed at how specific they get, right? The fact that they could tell you, you know, like which which regions you're from it is it is sort of mind blowing. A little bit worried about what they do with the data, mind you. But um, yeah, I my my so my test was also a, a bit surprising. So my dad's um, from Karbala in Iraq. My mom is from Newcastle, but most of my DNA was actually from like Armenia and the Caucasus, which we never have never have predicted beforehand. So it is. A little eye opening for sure. It's nice to just, yeah, I don't know, maybe it's because I've got a bit older that I've got a bit more interested in the family story and the family journey and stuff. But, but no, it's crazy, you know, and I think, you know, on, on, on immigrants specifically, I, I think it's just great because you, you want that immigrant mentality, you know, that you go to a new country and you want to contribute, you want to build something, you want to feel like you fit in part of society. And, and I just find mm -hmm. that mindset fascinating. Yeah, there is, I think, um, there is this real drive for, you know, like self-sufficiency amongst kind of immigrant communities. Um, you know, everyone wants to be able to support themselves, do well, support their families. And I think, you know, the, the how you arrive and like, um, has a big impact on that, you know? So I think I mentioned that a lot of my family arrived in the UK as refugees and it was really eye-opening just kind of watching you know what they have to go through to just try and get set up in a similar place they were before right you know doctors that don't have their medical degrees recognized right and have to start rebuilding so i think yeah the i agree that the 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 mentality is definitely one of you know let's make this work let's do everything we can 
but I think you know there's some some real structural issues that can can make it much harder frankly yeah how does the banking work then like if I just um, so your your family that came to the UK oh yeah could they have opened a bank right. account with rewire today or would they have needed yes yeah, so some more? So today, actually, they, they could have done. Um, so Rewire will accept um, refugee IDs, right? Um, by the way, what's interesting is a lot of ID checks are kind of done by API, and there's a few companies that will like stand behind it and check everyone's IDs, but they tend to not index um, refugee IDs from across Europe just because that, that market's pretty small. So actually at Rewire, we have done that. So we can accept refugees and onboard them and give them a basic basic like account and a card connected to it. So today they, they actually could have done, which is really nice to say, but like typically banks just want a lot of information, right? I think anyone that's moved countries that kind of has felt this, they, they often want to see an employment contract, uh, a proof of address, uh, maybe even a rental contract on your house. And that stuff is just challenging, right? It, it challenging for me when I arrived in the Netherlands 18 months ago, you know, I didn't have a, a I was staying with a friend when I showed up. So like, I think the, 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 the typical barriers are quite high. And what's nice now is they're coming down and you know, Rewise definitely helped them with that. Um, but it's still difficult. You know, if they wanted to get an account at a traditional bank, that, that isn't easy still. Yeah. So you do, yeah, it's tough, right? So you do need some kind of proof of ID, address, something. Yeah. Yeah, you definitely. need an internet definitely. connection, presumably, right? I mean, to use to use an internet bank mm -hmm. or like a branchless bank, you're going to have to have the old mobile phone. And if you can't get a contract, yeah. I mean. Yeah, for sure. Actually, the, the mobile companies have done a really good job uh, making the like, internet connections available. There's a few of them where you can like show up at the airport, buy a SIM card and you're off, right? So I actually think like telephony and cell phones and internet is, is pretty solved. It's just like the the older rules banks still have on account opening that, that make it tougher. Yeah, I tried to open a bank account. So I, I've got a I set up a company in the US, and um, so fine. One I was trying to open an account in the UK for ages, just a second bank account and stuff. And it was it took me like I don't know maybe six weeks to get an appointment to go see the bank, like for yeah. Santander, Barclays. I can't remember which one it was. So on a name and shame. Um, but I went and it took ages. So I set up a company in the US and it took me it took me about two weeks to set up the company and have the bank account open and like we're ready to, you know, we're ready to rock and roll. It was amazing. They 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 scanned they, they did a video call with me, they checked all my documents on the video, they they were a notary, mm -hmm. a notary checked my stuff. I was still trying to rearrange some uh, some meeting with the UK bank for a thing here, and I'm not already bank with you. <laughs> it's it's really just yeah. It's, yeah. No, we've come a long way. The fact you had to get a notary involved, those that kind of blows my mind, right? <laughs> I, I, I like notaries and apply. all this this stuff exists, and it's all about like ID verification. There are just so many better ways to do that now. You know, you can like you not, like your. So you guys don't use any of that or? So, I mean, for us, basically, like we'll do, we'll ask you to do a selfie. Um, as you state the arts, like a video selfie to show you're a living person and that you match the picture of your passport. So we'll ask you to take a picture of your ID um, and then just give us your details, right? Like email address, phone number, and kind of that's sufficient. That's sufficient actually under European law to, to open one of our accounts. Um, whole process takes about three minutes and kind of that's how it should be frankly you know wow. um your, your your id is it is you know not a secret it's pretty easy to verify so like you know uh, the days of getting documents like certified and notarized definitely hopefully are coming to an end so how do you know if how can you tell if they're real and genuine and not fraudulent and stuff yeah it's that is a good question i mean without giving too much away there's a lot of um so a lot of information when you take a picture of like an ID document, you know, like holograms, other security yeah. bits and pieces. So, you know, they're, they're very easily checked. Um, and actually now there's a whole industry in ID verification. It's pretty interesting. Um, you know, companies will like double check and verify documents um, from across the UK and across Europe. And, 
you know, give you a, a green light, red light on, you know, if this is a valid document. Um, this is, and this is really like enabling the growth of fintech, right? Like, you know, once you take away the burden of proof, um, sorry, not the burden of proof, but the difficulty in, in like ID verification, like suddenly it's very easy to open the account online. So now most of like the, the modern internet banks are doing that now. Um, it just hasn't necessarily been promoted or used with like migrant groups and like working migrants, like cooks, cleaners, nurses, right? They should also have access to this. Um, so yeah, we're, we're very happy to be able to offer um, easy onboarding. Nice, love that, love that. So, okay, so you can do, and your, are your accounts only Euro or, so if, if someone in, yeah. I don't know, Netherlands want to, wants to immigrate to the UK, they've already got a bank account with you, they can just, they can go wherever they want. Yeah, so we're, we're open in the UK and in the Eurozone. So, you know, okay. um, you can open a UK account or Euro account. Um, it's quite nice. We've been growing like very nicely in the UK the last few months. Like, interestingly, you know, COVID has been a um, terrible time for the world, but like actually quite, quite beneficial for digital financial services. In what, in what way? So I think, you know, a lot of people are just at home with their phones and they need financial services and don't necessarily want to go out you know, to their bank or in our case, we like facilitate international money transfer as well. So they don't want to go to the, the physical place they've done that. Um, so you've seen just this like huge spike in um, online banking, let's say, right? And so bringing that to migrants also for international money transfer needs has been you know, a dramatically positive experience during COVID. Um, I think a lot of people have talked about no market shrinking and you know international money transfer shrinking, but uh, the digital corner of this market has like exploded over the last six to nine months. Awesome. So the silver lining in the pandemic for you guys is is really the uptake in digital banking. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's weird to talk about any silver lining at this point. Uh, I mean, today I'm I'm trying to work out if I can come back to England for Christmas to see family, but uh, the thing that is kept me busy and you know somewhat sane over the this period as has been the business has been doing really well so yeah you know, very Amazing. very happy about that let's we talked a little bit about it off air briefly but i want to talk about hiring a little bit how have you found how have you found virtual hiring yeah we've some we've, we've been because we've been growing we've been hiring and yeah we have brought on quite a lot of people during this period and i think it is strange. You know? I think we are used to getting so much from you know, just meeting in person, getting a feel of, of you know, who you're talking to, understanding their energy, you know, like kind of yeah. feeling a bit more trust in them. And yeah, we've had to, to flip that entirely to you know, video calls like this. Um, and so we, we have been managing to hire, like we just actually have a new hire starting in Amsterdam tomorrow that I've never met, <laughs> just talked to on video. Um, and I think like, the key thing is just kind of building in some time for let's call it like the non-interview questions you know i think it's like very easy on a video call to be like bang 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 question one yeah. question two question three and kind of lose any sense of like who, who you're talking to so just building in kind of some some blank time just to, to see if you get on with this hire has been has been pretty important um and i can't say it's been a success yet i'll, I'll let you know in six months <laughs> but um yeah. We, we have been focusing on, on, on trying to make sure we, you know, can create that like connection with the person we're hiring, even if, you know, we're on tiny little screens on our, our laptops while doing it. Have you been doing to the candidate and one other person or have you been doing like larger group interviews? Yeah, we, we started with a bigger, well, it's, it, we, we, we tend to do one on one. Um, absolutely. But the, the funnel is a little bit bigger. Right. So. You have everyone that applies, people that get to the first round, second round, third round, et cetera. Um, so we've been trying to do a bigger funnel to start with. Um, and what is also super interesting is like so location. Funnel, so a bigger funnel in terms of you and one other interviewing the candidate, for example. Yeah, just kind of like, yeah, more bringing in more applications at the early stages, okay. right, I think is yeah. how I put it, just to, get, to give a broader cross section. Yeah. Um, and caring a little bit less about where they are as well, you know. Location wise, we're yeah. going to be working on it. Absolutely, right? we're going to be working yeah. on a digital screen. So 
I don't mind too much if you're in kind of Amsterdam or Stockholm. Um, I just kind of want to know that you're going to be able to do the job and fit in with the team. So yeah, definitely starting with a bigger funnel and um, paying a little bit more attention to references as well. You know, like, like trying to find people within the network one or two degrees removed just to get like a more trusted point of view on uh, who you're talking with has also been very valuable for us. So, so you've, you've, so you've identified a final candidate and then you'd contact, maybe you'd look at LinkedIn, you'd see who's connected with them and you, and you'd shoot them a note saying, I'm about to offer Jane the job, you know, we'd love to hear your thoughts on, on what you think she's like. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think references in Europe, my experience is people take them like a little bit less seriously. Well, actually during COVID, I think people should take them very seriously. Um, it kind of it kind of speaks volumes if you if you can't get someone to talk on your behalf right now, you know, um, yes. and gives me a lot a lot more confidence if there are a couple of people that you know are willing to like vouch for you. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been interesting to see. I've, I've had a few cases where that hasn't gone as well, and it kind of raises it raises some questions. But yeah, we typically ask the candidate directly, "Hey, can you give us two or three people yeah. who you've worked with?" And we'd love to have a quick chat with them if that's all right with you. Cool. Yeah, it's good. On those two points, it's interesting. One big trend I've noticed from clients is people's willingness to hire people from wherever. It used to be people much more focused on location. But the wonderful thing is, you know, the, the talent pools are much wider. You know, if you're sourcing from all over Europe, you have a much wider pool of talent, a more diverse pool of talent, and, and you're going to ultimately end up with a better hire, which which is great. It's great to see you guys doing that. And it's a real good trend that's, that's come out of this. Completely, completely agree. 100%. It is um, eye opening when you see, you know, literally candidates coming in from UK, Lithuania, Portugal, and extremely well qualified, right? And in a world yeah. where you want them to come into the office every day, you'd probably overlook that candidate or, you know, yeah. make it a requirement that they relocate. But that's just like completely turned on its head now. It doesn't matter at all. Yeah. I think it's great. References. References are interesting on, on that. So in the UK, it's illegal to give a bad reference. And there's been court cases. No way. Yeah. So, That's, you know, if I, if someone huh. said, hey, you know, what's Alex like? And I'm like, well, you know, whatever, you know, give you kind of a little negative uh, reference and you don't get the job. And you could be like, you know, Lewis, you know, that's just your that's just your opinion, you know, or we had an argument and we didn't get on for some reason doesn't mean you're a bad guy doesn't mean you're not going to be amazing for the job you've you've applied for so so there's little cultural differences around um most most of the vast majority of my clients can't do do references for sure but um but most of them are obviously going to be positive because they give you the references so um it's 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 a, it's yeah. an interesting one i'm not sure i land on them now i mean You'd rather do them than not, for sure. Um, but yeah, it's huh. changed. I, I, I actually didn't. I didn't know that about the UK. So do you, do you just get like variances from like so amazing in the UK, to like very good? So in the UK, well, so uh, if you wanted to contact Apple, for example, for a reference for someone that you're hiring from there, um, or they'd worked there previously in the UK, they confirm the dates that they've worked there and what their job title was. So you can confirm that they what they've said in their CV is correct and true. Um, what 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 companies like that won't do is say, I think Alex is great, or you know, would you hire him mm -hmm. again? They wouldn't answer those kind of questions. Um, yeah. If you can get to people that are just kind of not associated so much with the company, but just, you know, I know you worked with him before, do you mind having a quick chat? Then you're more likely to get a kind of more interesting relevant reference um yeah. so yeah they're interesting what i what i'm fascinated with right now is so most states in the us it's illegal to ask a candidate for their current salary details um yes which which i think is great and, and links to immigration which which i want to i want to cover like link it to in the UK and most countries in Europe, you ask a candidate and if they don't say it's a bit odd um, and, and, and clients want to know, you know, how much has this person been making? And you, you kind of, you know, up front in America, you can't ask if you're a headhunter, you can't ask if you're a, a company hiring. Hmm. Um, what do you think about yeah. that? 
you know, like, I, I'm kind of torn on it. I, I mean, I like the fact that Powers with like the candidate, absolutely, right, in, in that situation to say, you know, what, what they're on or what they're not on. Um, so I think overall what I saw in the US is candidates very willing to tell you what they want. Right. Yeah. What or, are you know, much more up, much <laughs> exactly yeah, much more upfront with like this is the bar. If you can get to it, I'm interested. If you're not, then don't worry too much. So I've, I've seen that cultural difference a lot. It's like people are much more willing to talk about how much they would like in the US as opposed to Europe when hi in hiring. Um, but yeah, I it also leads to funny recruiter questions, right? I remember getting contact by recruiters and they'd all, they'd always ask you, you know, like what salary would you be would make you want to move jobs, right? So I, I think people work out how to get around it. But you know, I think in the US, despite that, people are much more, you know, willing to say you know, what they would like to get paid as opposed to European candidates. Yeah, no, that's true. The, 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 on the pros of, of that, I think I see a lot of people here and in the US, if they're immigrants and they've not worked in, so let's say London. England they've not worked here really before or they've got a little bit of experience they get paid less than than people that have worked here for most of their career for no good reason just well you know they were earning less in whichever country they came from we don't want to give them a big increase why should we yeah um, and we can try yeah. and get them a bit cheaper and and I see that a lot and I speak to some some candidates that have come to the UK um, they're not they're just a notch or two below in terms of earnings for no good reason just they're not from here yeah it, it's just sad yeah it's 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 like very sad right but I think a lot of it is still like expectations and what people expect to get paid and I actually tell this to my team all the time it's like you could like always ask for the salary increase right like always ask me for the salary increase I'll tell you if we can do it or if we can't do it by the way I hope they're not listening too closely to this one, but always <laughs> ask right uh, if you if you don't you can ask it a nice way, but if you never ask for it, then it, it tends to not happen. I yeah. think for people that maybe have had a less like secure employment history or just feel that they're on a good salary, they tend to not ask when like they they always should, in my opinion. Yeah, no, it's true. It's true. It feels like you know if you're if you're if you're looking for someone to do a job, and it you think it's worth a certain amount of money, then hey, you're up front. This is what it's going to pay. And you can be earning more because it works the other way around yeah. too. I, I, you find a lot of people are passed over for jobs because they're too experienced or people think that because they've been earning more, they're going to run or leave for something. So it, it works kind of both ways. But yeah, it feels like, you know, this is the job. This is what it's paying you interested or not. And uh, it feels like that's the way it's going. But people do love a good negotiation. You know, as humans, we love negotiating. I mean... <laughs> Yeah, I, mean, I, I would. I, I love the idea of like, you know, predefined salary ranges, knowing what you're looking for going in. I think that's that's great. But uh, yeah, the, especially as you get more senior, I think there is more negotiation happens. You know? Look, I mean, let's be um, honest. I mean, like, you know, a company can have an amazing strategy, but without great people, you're not going anywhere. So there's, there's in, you know, in reality, there's a big, big competition for great people. You want the best. And you, you're probably willing to, to pay a little bit over what your competitor is paying or offer some different perks, benefits, work from anywhere, whatever it might be. So there's always going to be that element to this because it's uh, it's business and commerce and you want to get the advantage. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's very true. Um, I totally agree with that. I also, you know, think that you know, some jobs, you know, somewhat, like if you have to hire like 20 support personnel, that, that should be a generic job description with a set salary range, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so there is, there is some variation there for sure. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I've never had a job that hasn't had some negotiation on the way in. Yeah. Oh no, true, true, that's true. One, one last thing I'm interested in, in understanding is so you've, been, you've been building this new company and, and hiring these people. How have you, how have you gone about like, building a culture and it's a super tough question and a bit harsh that I'm asking you, but it, it, I think it's interesting because you know you might find that most of the people that you're work that are working in your team probably joined over over the pandemic maybe you know they've never you know had a coffee with you 
they've not experienced the office. I mean, it's so different, right? It's, how have you gone about that? Yeah, it's, it's, it, this is really challenging, 100%. And I, I don't know that we've like solved the problem. You know, I'd love to hear from people if, if they have, right? What's worked and what hasn't. Um, there are a couple of like bright sparks, I would say, you know, the, even though we're not together, we've actually started this thing on Friday, which we just like team Fridays, where everyone in the team like just signs up for a time slot. They can do whatever they want with it. Last, last sure. Friday, we had a team member actually based in Thailand teach us how to cut like decorational fruits for the holiday season, which was a lot of fun. I right, everyone yeah. like, like had watermelons and knives out and was having a go at it. Um, so, so we definitely haven't cracked it, but there is purpose like this, like intentionally and purposefully creating some time to like, you know, have some fun and have some unstructured time, do some weird activities. You, you can still do a lot online, but that, that's been helping. Absolutely. Yeah. But um, I would still say the team you know, misses that interaction. I think we all do. Yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. I've actually felt weirdly I've got closer to my team over, over lockdown because in the office you kind of you didn't appreciate it. You walk in, you might a little nod. You know, how was the weekend? Great. You know, you crack, kind of crack on. You get on the phone or whatever. Whereas, whereas, whereas over the the pandemic, I've had to actually make time to speak to people. You know, I'd call my call my team uh, in the morning. All of them. We do a, an unstructured half an hour chat a little we have a little oasis of positivity on a, a 2 p.m little chat i don't know, i just feel like i've actually had to think about it a lot more than i i did before um so yeah i don't know oddly mm -hmm. i felt i've got closer to people this uh like this year that's great i mean that, that's a great result i think it speaks a lot to like you know the intentionality of it if you're like making that time you, you actually will like connect in a probably uh a deeper way than just a, a serendipitous 20 second chat about the football or having coffee so no i love that you've been doing that yeah, yeah no and i think it you know i think this kind of stuff works because we are human we want the contact we want the the kind of intimacy friendship type stuff and you know hopefully that continues it's going to be interesting to see what happens uh into 2021 um yeah yeah, yeah i agree you know i think it's going to be a bit blurry for a few more months while we wait to yeah. see what we're going to be allowed to do definitely it's awesome well alex thank you so much for chatting with me it's been great hopefully we get to meet face to face non non virtually or in person however you phrase it uh soon no me too me too yeah oh, thank you it's great great to chat um and uh thanks for having me thanks so much take care see ya